All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Justin Gall. I'm our business development manager here at CBS Power Products, and welcome to today's presentation on vacuum interrupters, how they work and how they fail. Um, our presenter today is Finley Ledbetter. He's our company's founder and our chief scientist. Uh, today's presentation was built around introducing our field-based MAC test or Magnetron Atmosphere Condition Test for Vacuum Interrupters or Bottles. And we cannot effectively explain that technology without first going through how a vacuum interrupter is built, how it works, and how it could fail. So I think you'll find today educational. And to lead us through that presentation, I'd like to turn it over and introduce you to Finley Ledbetter. Uh, the majority of vacuum interrupters were, in, were installed in the late 70s, early 80s, when uh, the U.S. kind of went, really the world kind of went from air to vacuum switch gear. You know, the progression was switch and fuse to oil to air uh, to gas to vacuum. Uh, gas didn't live very long at the uh, medium voltages because of the environmental issues and the problems with leaking SF6 gas. So really, it jumped from air to vacuum, uh, gas was there, but it didn't make a big impact. And the way this happened is, you know, the plant engineers at the time were all in their 60s. And they had all come out of World War II. They were guys that worked with their hands, with wrenches, with tools. They were well-versed. They had built these plants. They had put them together. And the salespeople at the time came in and said, hey, what about if I can come up with a technology of a circuit breaker where you won't have to bake out the arc chutes, burnish the contacts, do all this heavy maintenance, and you can save all that money. And quickly they did the dynamics and looked at all of the metrics and said, hey, if we don't have to do all this heavy maintenance, this is much cheaper. So vacuum technology was very quickly adopted and it's a, it's a superior technology, it should have been. What really didn't come out was the fact that the message got passed then is that this equipment had a life expectancy or a manufacturer's design shelf life of 20 years. Now, will it last longer than that? Yes, it will. It'll last much longer than that. That was simply the design expectancy shelf life of the vacuum switchgear based around the vacuum interrupter, sealed bearings uh, where they weren't going to have to lubricate them. All sorts of things were promised uh, to the users. The problem was that information didn't get passed down to future generations of engineers. So that kind of uh, died, so to speak, uh, with the uh, early age of the plant engineers that actually adopted this in the 70s and 80s, because most of those are out of the business now. I was just getting in the business as a field service uh, engineer in the late 70s, early 80s. So I heard all that and I kind of bridged this. Uh, vacuum engineers, vacuum interrupters that have been that were installed in this period have far exceeded their manufacturer's life expectancy. This stuff has done great. I mean, it has been unbelievably dynamic. It has been resilient. It's gave it's given everybody their money's worth. It's it's given you great utility. The problem is, right now there is no replacement interrupter. There's no replacement technology close uh, to the market which means there is no planned replacement that's gonna get here quick enough to do us any good. So if you look back at the 70s and 80s till the day, that's getting close to 50 years, there's no replacement. So we have to find a way to keep this equipment in service for a hundred years. Now, everybody's gonna look at the ground and say, hundred years, are you kidding me? I'm not kidding you. And we can do it. You know, the thing we've been missing is the, is the vacuum interrupter. The, the mechanisms, the busing, the controls, the instrument transformers, we can replace all that. We don't really want to move this old switchgear anyway. That means we're going to have to disturb the cables, which is going to be a whole other problem we don't want to deal with. Uh, most of the switchgear is being installed in areas where equipment has grown up around it. Walls have gone up. It's harder to get out. The downtime is tremendous. We can recondition or remanufacture the mechanisms. We can install new motors, new coils. We can retime uh, the mechanisms. We can replace the vacuum interrupters and we can keep this equipment in service. All you have to do is upgrade the instruments, upgrade the instrument transformers, and you've got essentially new switch gear because the rest is copper bus, nuts, bolts, and steel, and it'll live 100 years easy. So it's your job, the 300 people on this call, it's been my job for 50 years 
to find ways to keep this old equipment in service. And now we're being asked to keep it in service 100 years or more. So think about that one. A failure of a vacuum interrupter could result in unnecessary downtime and damage to the surrounding equipment. That happens all the time. When I first got in this business, we saw a vacuum interrupter failure uh, very seldom. Okay, and when we did see one, it was usually not a catastrophic failure. It was usually found in maintenance. We'd do an AC high pot test, go, no go, it would not go. So we would contact the owner and say, hey, you've got one vacuum interrupter. And we probably saw this once a month, twice a month. Today, we see about 20 a day, a day. And when I first got into this business, we saw maybe one every month or two. We did not see very many at all in the early 70s, excuse me, late 70s, early 80s. What really happened here, and what drove us to this decision to do this, uh, to give you a little background, and I'm gonna move faster, I promise, when I get through this slide. Anyway, so what I was gonna say was when the breakers would come into our shop and we had one interrupter failure, we would tell the customer, which are you, the participants in this, hey, you've had a failure, but maybe you should consider replacing those other two interrupters because they've been made at the same time, they're from the same batch, they're the same age, they've seen the same service. But quite often, most of the time, we would get the order just to replace one interrupter. It would go back in service. And then at some point before too long, we might see a second failure on that breaker. With this equipment, we can qualify those other two interrupters and determine if they really are in danger of failure or not. Because quite often, it's simply an accelerated leak rate on that one interrupter. The traditional tests, there's a pass-fail test, which tells you today the condition of the interrupter. And that's not capable of determining the level of vacuum inside of the interrupter or not capable of determining the life expectancy. Uh, Westinghouse, Cutler Hammer, Eaton Today, GE, ABB, Siemens, Toshiba, Fuji, uh, all these manufacturers use MAC testing at their factory. They use a magnetron test set to test the vacuum interrupters leak rate as they're manufactured in batches at the factory. They've always used it. This is nothing new. All we did was miniaturize this and develop a way to take it to the field. These are the standard tests used by the original manufacturers used even today at the factories uh, to determine the leak rate. This is a basic uh, design of a vacuum interrupter we're gonna go through here and hopefully you can see my cursor. Typically what you have is you have a fixed stem, you have a movable portion, you have a bellows, you have a shield that protects the bellows from essentially radiation. You have an insulated canister of some sort made of some sort of metallized ceramic or glass. Uh, and it has a shield that protects it from all types of metal vapors and nasty things that are emitted from these contacts when they're open under her high power. If it didn't have this shield, when the interrupter opens, it would splatter metal vapor all on the inside of this insulator. And essentially this insulator would pass voltage across it and the interrupter would fail. The bellows is a key part of this operation, as is all the solder joints. Essentially what happens is this interrupter is stacked together and there's rings of raising filler material that go in all of these locations that seal all this in a vacuum furnace. We happen to have a vacuum interrupter manufacturing plant in Denton, Texas, and all 300 of you are welcome to come tour at any time, just give us a call. I'll be glad to meet you there and show you how these are put together. We manufacture vacuum interrupters in Denton, Texas, have for some time now. And I can show you exactly how they're built and I can uh, take, take one apart and better explain it to you. This bellows here is the real problem. The bellows is designed to open, close, open, close, open, close, open, close. It does not like torsion. So what happens is in the bottom of most interrupters there's a threaded bolt that usually connects the, the line side and the line side and load side bus, the load side is normally collected, connected through a flexible link of some kind. There's usually a bolted joint there. And lots of times when people pull maintenance on this equipment or they recondition this equipment, they put torsion on that bolt. And when they do that, only a couple of degrees of torsion will cause this bellows to fail very quickly. One degree of torsion, 10% degradation, two degrees of torsion, 30% degradation, three degrees of torsion, the bellows will fail immediately. So it's very easy to damage this bellows. So be very careful. 
when you hire someone to do maintenance repairs or maintenance on vacuum switch gear that they use some sort of blocking device and they do not apply any torsion to the bellows. If they happen to be tightening this bolt, not a good idea. If they happen to be using any type of cleaning material, ensure they're not using anything that's chloride based. This is only a few mils thick of stainless steel. All chlorides, all salts attack stainless steel pretty aggressively. We've had many failures where we've done forensics and we've come back and found out that the cleaning material is what actually destroyed the bellows. Uh, it was not an airborne contaminant, but actually a type of citrus cleaner or a type of cleaner or salt in the air that got to the bellows. And we can get to that later on. Okay, this is how the interrupter basically works. This is a, a, a breaker with an axial magnetic field. Here's the bellows, here's the shield. This uh, brazing filler metal frozen joint here actually holds the shield in place, as you see here. This is the shield that protects the contacts. Uh, whenever it opens, protects the, well, let's just run it out here to where we can see. Here's the bellows, here's the shield, there's the contacts. So as you can see, the bellows is very thin stainless steel, like an accordion, which allows the contacts to open and close 10 or 12 millimeters, quarter of an inch to three quarters of an inch, depending upon the voltage and the speed and velocity the mechanism uh, operates on. Here's the moving contact, here's the stationary contact, here's the stationary a uh, stud that's connected usually to the line side, the moving stud that's normally connected to the load side. Here's the ceramic glass or metallized ceramic case. Here's a, an, a, a joint that is connected to, per, to hold the shield and suspend the shield. So every one of these joints is a particular leak. It's a particular place for you to gain a, a leak. And you can see there's a, there's a solder joint here. There's a solder joint up here on this end. There's a solder joint on that end. I say solder, it's not really solder. Uh, it's, that's just old school talk. It's really a very sophisticated brazing filler material that is melted with a specific capillary action to seal these joints and bond to the ceramic. And it does a very nice job. The general accepted philosophy is the leak rate that you're looking for is three times 10 to the minus seven PA per week three times 10 to the minus 78 per week from minus five gives you 29 years to atmosphere. So that's really what they look for is they test these interrupters at the factory to be sure they have an acceptable leak rate before they ship them out. They test them in batches. Sometimes some manufacturers test all of them in critical applications. Here's the interrupter as it's beginning to operate. So now the, the, the interrupter has been asked to interrupt a uh, load current, maybe a fault, maybe just standard load current, maybe it's in motor starting application, who knows what it's doing, and it's starting to interrupt. Now what it does is, as the AC sine wave crosses zero, at next crossing zero, it interrupts the arc. Now, is there sometimes some restrike and it take more than next crossing zero? Yes, but we're not gonna consider that right now. We're gonna consider, uh, good working physics, okay? So at next crossing zero, which is very quick, so the chopping currents can be very high and the new contact materials have been designed to address that where you don't get the hit you used to get with early vacuum interrupters that damage motors and cables. You don't see the copying, chopping currents and you don't see as many MOVs used as you used to. So as it begins to open, it begins to develop these arc roots. These arc roots are actually, well, there was the initial problem designing vacuum interrupters. Those arc roots act like a gouging rod in a, in a arc welder, and they'll physically blow a hole through the contact material. So arc engineers, physicists, scientists had to design a way to stop that from happening. It took them about 40 years from the 20s to the, excuse me, from the 30s to the 50s to figure a way to stop that from happening to where they could design an interrupter that would interrupt more than about 10 or 12,000 amps. And the way they did that's pretty ingenious. So as you see, as they, as they, as they see how they're moving, 
that movement is what stops them from gouging a hole through the contacts. They use either a radial or an axial magnetic field to make these root arcs dance around the contact surface so they don't stay in one place and burn a hole through it. And that's what you're seeing right there is you're seeing an axial magnetic field design, which is actually, uh, and it's causing the arc roots to dance around on the contact material. What that does, it doesn't burn a hole through one place. With that, we've been able to design vacuum interrupters up into the 80 kA range. Uh, Eaton has a 80 kA interrupter now they're using in traction applications that's uh, very sophisticated, a very good interrupter. Uh, Finley, we do have a question that just came in. Um, what is chopping current and is it related to fast interruption of the contacts? Popping current's a very bad thing. The interrupter is held together by a thing called a wipe spring. So you have pressure. You have about 1,000 to 1,200 foot pounds of force holding the interrupter together. As the interrupter operates, wears off contact material and the contacts get smaller. As they do, they move closer together and the wipe spring gets degraded. So the pressure holding the wipe spring gets degraded. That's one of the reasons you have a wear limit on a circuit breaker that says, hey, once we wear this amount, we no longer can use this interrupter. It's not necessarily because the contact material is gone. It's a combination of that and you're shortening the interrupter so the wipe spring won't hold adequate pressure. If you don't hold adequate pressure with a bolted through fault, which an interrupter almost never sees a completely bolted through fault, I would say it's never going to see a bolted, a completely direct bolted pressure through fault, but it has to be designed to stand that. It has to have adequate white pressure to hold it closed or else the magnetic forces involved will pop the interrupter open during the fault. That creates a condition called ferro resonance. Ferro resonance is terrible on dry type and liquid fuel transformers, rotating equipment, uh, all sorts of mechanical equipment where the three phases in the system become unbalanced and put tremendous stresses on your system. So you don't want one interrupter popping open for a part of a cycle or a cycle. And that can only happen, well, it can only happen for lots of reasons, based around a vacuum interrupter. Basically, it's if the wipe spring can no longer hold it closed. A circuit breaker is designed to withstand a bolted through fault with the interrupters being properly uh, set being properly held and everything working correctly, the breaker responding in time, running to speed and velocity on time. If everything runs correctly, if the breaker is properly calibrated, it's designed to open its rated amount of current voltage. If it does that, it will withstand the popping forces that can be created. What happens is the system is stiffened as engineers and people come in and stiffen the system. They come in and put bigger transformers. They come in and put bigger cables. And these forces are not considered sometime throughout the entire system. That's what a short circuit study is for. But a study only gives you the numbers. If you don't mitigate the numbers and go in and upgrade the equipment, they don't do you any good. So popping forces are the forces that work against the breaker to pop it open in the event of a big through fault. And that's a magnetic effect uh, that the breaker is designed for if it's properly maintained and properly rated in a system it's designed to withstand the popping forces. It's very important that your breaker repair shop maintains the wipe springs and that the wipe springs on the breaker are uh, properly rated. So as the breaker goes to interrupt the fault, you can see these arc roots are extinguished, the arc is extinguished. All that happens within a half a cycle or less. It happens very quickly. And I want to tell you something that it took a bunch of years and a bunch of work to develop a way to make that happen without burning holes and pits in the contact because each of those arc roots can sustain up to about 200 amps uh, of, uh, of current. Uh, Finley, one more question there just related to arc roots since you're on the topic. Uh, what creates the magnetic field that makes arc roots dance? A lot of current passing through a breaker that has a steel frame very quickly. You pass a lot of current through a steel frame breaker in a steel enclosure. Current in ferrous metal equals magnetic force. Magnetic force creates all kinds of conditions and all kinds of effects. 
the popping forces are basically an impulse of energy passing through the breaker uh, that will uh, be a joined or added to by magnetic forces. There are a lot of things involved in creating popping forces. I think the, the proper way to look at it is it's a magnetic effect. The most common failures in vacuum interrupters are contact erosions, number one. Every time the breaker opens and closes, you get a little bit of erosion, whether it's under load or not. The higher the load, the faster it's going to erode. Other things that happen is physical force. You know, typically a contactor with two or three or 400 foot pounds of force, a vacuum circuit breaker with a thousand or 1200 pounds of force, there's a tremendous amount of energy pushing this breaker together over time. You can see the contact material can start to fracture like you see here. This is out of a 5 kV contactor. It's pretty common. This is called a button contact. Well, it's a modified button contact, but you see this sort of failure quite often in repetitive duty application motor starting something let's say the motor chatters okay you have a control issue that charles is the contactor to open and close a bunch of times back to back the material is superheated and then it's banged together and you see this kind of damage here you also see button contacts like this that have boiling point issues where they've seen repetitive duty and they've got hot over and over again and they've been open and closed faster than they should vacuum interrupters and breakers are rated for a certain number of opens and closes every every so many milliseconds in order to allow the contact material to puddle and cool if you exceed that especially in motor starting applications you will you'll see this kind of failure uh, this is a radial magnetic field ge design this came out of the facility in iowa uh, this is a typical example of an interrupter that has been in service for some period of time. And the sacrificial contact uh, there, the part of the interrupter, the, the main contact has seen a lot of damage. This would see a contact resistance of about 100 micro, micro ohms, and it would be something that you would want to replace. This would be a contact erosion failure. The number one failure in vacuum interrupters is contact erosion, not loss of vacuum, okay? The second biggest, the second failure is mechanical failure. Mechanical failures are due to them being operated with wipe spring issues, with popping forces, uh, all kinds of design issues, bellows failures, all kinds of failures that can happen. Here's one where the physical contact in an Eaton interrupter fell off. It wasn't properly uh, brazed at the factory and it was loose inside the interrupter. There was physically no contact attached to the, the moving side of the interrupter. Uh, you see a lot of bellows failures. This is normally due to some uh, torsion that's exerted uh, on the interrupter in maintenance or in test, or it was improperly installed at the factory. This is a be bellows failure. Mechanical failure also can occur because interrupters are designed for so many thousand operations. Every breaker, every interrupter has a design target of so many thousand or hundred thousand operations. A contactor, for instance, is designed for repetitive duty, so it may have a million operation life cycle design. A circuit breaker may be only a few thousand, 20,000, 30,000, 100,000, depending upon the design, voltage class, and operating uh, criteria of the breaker. So when a breaker starts to exceed its mechanical limits, you'll start to see mechanical failures. You also see uh, all kinds of failures when foreign objects get into the breakers, snakes, spider webs, bird, birds, corrosion, uh, salt water, uh, flood waters, all sorts of things that cause mechanical failures. Loss of vacuum is typically a catastrophic event if it's called upon to operate, depending on if it's a grounded or ungrounded system. You also see catastrophic failures and you see passive failures. You'll see vacuum interrupters fail. You'll test them, they'll be failed, but it was never called upon to operate anywhere near its full range of capabilities. Therefore, it never had to operate, so it didn't fail, but it would have if it would have had been called upon to operate under full load or full capacity. These are examples of interrupters that we've found in the field in situations to where interrupters with loss of vacuum were called upon to interrupt a big load, long piece of cable, big motor, RF, RF fault. 
the way the pinning and discharge mechanism works, the way our test set works, the way everybody else's test set works is very simple. It sounds complicated, but it's not. You have a gap, you apply a voltage, you force uh, electrons across the gap. The higher the pressure inside the canister, the more electrons that are gonna pass the gap. The fewer gas molecules in the chamber, the fewer electrons that are gonna pass across the gap. So what you do is very simple as you apply a potential, you measure the current flow, you apply a magnetic field, left-hand rule of magnetism, force electrons across that, across that open gap, you measure those with a very accurate ammeter, you feed that into a small computer and you calculate the pressure back based on a pressure curve, which I'm gonna show you here in just a second how we do that. So basically we charge uh, the, inter the interrupter with a high voltage. We, that aligns everything, a few electrons start to cross. We interact a magnetic field, more electrons start to cross. We compare the two, that equates to pressure. Let's do that again. We apply a potential 25,000 volts DC. Then uh, that starts to force a few electrons across the, air, the gap. Then we apply a, about a thousand Gauss magnetic field for a very short period of time. We take a sample measurement of the number of electrons that are passing across at that time. We compare the number without the field to the number with the field, and that gives us our ion current. And then we have a curve that I'm gonna get into in a minute that explains how we take ion current to pressure. This is Passion's dry air curve. Uh, Passion actually had a curve for all gases, it shows that dry air at about uh, one uh, centimeter has about 400,000 volts of uh, braking capacity at minus five PA. PA is Pascal, that's a measure of pressure. You can see here that it's very stable for a long period of time. And this could be 20 years, this could be 30 years. If it's a Mitsubishi interrupter, this could be a hell of a long time because Mitsubishis have a very low leak rate. So as you begin to progress here, you start to see here, according to Passion's research, the pressure starts to uh, change and somewhere between minus two and minus one, it fails and the interrupter will no longer do its job. So basically you have three zones. You have this zone here, which uh, your children can worry about it. You have this zone here, where if it's a critical application interrupter, you need to be concerned. You have this zone here. If it's in this zone here, you need to replace it. You need to replace the interrupter, replace the breaker, replace the switch gear. Basically, it can be worked up into three zones. Safe, uh, be careful, and replace. And this is all based on condition-based maintenance. If this is running the, as a, in, on the primary coolant pump of a nuclear reactor, you might treat it differently than if it's a circuit breaker that's running the parking lot lights at a uh, paper mill somewhere in the southeast. And so, that's a that's a good point to bring up the next question that I have here. Are there any limitations to operation based upon high and low temperatures? Yes. Uh, if we're talking about vacuum interrupters, vacuum interrupters are very robust, and high and low temperature do not affect them as much as the rest of the breaker. Obviously lubrication, uh, insulation, condensing moisture, uh, hot, cold, hot, cold is bad for everything. So there are problems that, that come from high temperatures, low temperatures, but what they really don't like is changing temperatures, going from very cold to very hot, very cold to very hot. We're talking about the circuit breaker itself. The vacuum interrupter itself is thermally very stable. Uh, there are thermal limits and that each interrupter is designed and in, in design test it's tested for. Uh, I don't have those numbers on the top of my head. I could certainly get them for you, uh, depending on what type of breaker you have. Uh, obviously, circuit breakers and most electromechanical devices do not like cold because lubricants do not perform well in cold. Most devices do not like varying thermal temperatures, starting a big motor in a cold, cold environment, then going cold and starting a big motor, doing that over and over again. A lot of condensation happens. A lot of corona uh, develops, uh, water trees change, lots of things happen in those changing thermal environments uh, with the older insulations. 
newer insulation, not so much. So to answer that question correctly, I'd have to get into what type of equipment are you talking about? What equipment do you have? What altitude are you at? What temperatures are you talking about? Be glad to discuss that with you offline uh, after the presentation. If you want to get my number and uh, give me a text or a email, I'll get back to you on it. And, hey, and thank you for that. And then uh, one, one last one came in, and I guess it's re re about the chart you currently have up in the pressures. Is this a pass-fail test or something like MAC testing? Say it again. The, the passions curve here where we're looking at the chart, is that from MAC testing or is that from the, a high pot of pass-fail? This is an applied potential across an air gap. And this is the amount of voltage that that air gap will withstand as long as it's at that pressure. So you see at the bottom at minus six, minus five is the pressure on the moon. Minus five is approximately the number of gas molecules on the moon. So you have a very low pressure at minus five. Interrupters are normally manufactured below minus five. When they begin to leak back to atmosphere, which they all do, eventually it will get down between minus one, minus two, and fail. The question is, how long is that? Is that 20 years, 30 years, 50 years, or 100 years? Well, our research has determined that with most interrupters, it's in excess of 30 years. Modern interrupters are not nearly as good and have a much higher leak rate than some of the older interrupters. So that's a conversation we're coming to here in a minute. Let's move forward. The way we create a pressure curve is we take a turbo molecular vacuum pump uh, here. We puncture a vacuum interrupter with a welded joint. We connect a, 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 a hose and we pump the interrupter down uh, and then we take a very accurate calibrated uh, pressure transducer and we measure the current. And then as it's being pumped down, we test it with the magnetron test set and we get 40 points going down and 40 points coming back up. And that's what is programmed into the max set for each interrupter. So basically to get an accurate pressure, you would have to have a specific pressure curve for every interrupter. Now you can get close but to get accuracy be, be less than 10%, you really have to have a curve for every interrupter. And we'll address that here in a minute. But this is the actual process in the lab by which we gather the data to program the max set with. This is a typical example. of uh, There's a technical paper that we'll have at NIDA and that I can send to you if you reach out to us after it where we went and we tested 350 vacuum circuit breakers in a particular facility in one place at, over at one time. And this was the result. These were a manufacturer. There's only one manufacturer that's maintained the, that's manufactured the same breaker for 40 years. So I'm not gonna tell you who it is, but, but uh, uh, that particular breaker was a 15 kV circuit draw out vacuum circuit breaker and the same breaker has been manufactured for 40 years. And we have equipment in the plant that was from four or five years old to 40 years old in the same breaker. And we were able to test them in one maintenance outage uh, do all sorts of electrical tests, MAC tests, high pot test, uh, timing tests, all sorts of things. And we extract this information. The equipment that was one to 10 years old, we saw very few uh, high pressure interrupters. We had only a few uh, medium pressure interrupters. We had a few that were in danger and we had a few that had failed. And this is an equipment that's less than 10 years old. Equipment that was 11 to 20 years old, you saw, we see we had a similar result, but you started to see more high pressure interrupters and a few failed interrupters. When you went to 21 to 30 years old, we started to see fewer uh, really low pressure interrupters, way more medium range interrupters and more uh, concern, concerned interrupters and more failed interrupters. When you went from 31 to 40 years, things changed tremendously. So, by the data we've gathered here and through testing thousands and thousands of interrupters, it's our belief that most modern interrupters have a life expectancy of close to 30 years, not the 20 years it was originally promised by the manufacturer. And many that we, we see that are 40 years old still have plenty of life left in them, but they do begin to near failure. This is what the TS4 MAC test set looks like with its flexible magnetic coil and the set attached to a, a Eaton BCPW breaker. You can see the coil is attached that creates the magnetic field. 
attach the test set and this will read out in both ion current and it will interpretate, excuse me, it will interpret that result and give you a pressure if that curve is programmed into this test set for the proper interrupter. This flexible magnetic coil, and this is both a patented uh, device uh, by group CBS. And this particular coil here is really the trick to the whole thing. Basically, I was able to patent a roll of copper wire. Figure that. But what this does is wraps around the interrupter five times and allows us to create the field we need on the breaker without removing the interrupter. About 80% of the medium voltage breakers that we encounter, we can get the flexible magnetic field on with very little problems. We may have to remove a barrier or two, but basically we can get it on. There are 10, 15, 20% of the breakers out there that require a little more work and that it's not friendly for doing maintenance testing and they need to come back to the shop to be tested. So before you get involved in this, check with one of our technicians or engineers and make sure the breakers that you're looking at doing are not one of the 10 or 15 percent that it's difficult to do in the field. Most of those are vacuum converted breakers where someone took an air breaker and physically converted it to vacuum or the manufacturer took an air breaker mechanism and fashioned vacuum interrupters on it in the transition period between air and vacuum. Most of the modern draw out vacuum breakers are very easily tested with our, with our technique. I'd like to stop right here and move over to a different presentation and show you something that I think is important for you to see. Um, Finley, in your transition, if I could pop one more question over to you. Sure. Some circuit breaker manufacturers do not recommend DC testing on the vacuum bottle AC only. Is there any potential for excessive damage to the bottle using DC or is it possible that an erroneous result could be obtained if you do not test the bottle twice, switching polarity in between? Okay. Uh, the manufacturers all, well, they don't, the manufacturers should all recommend AC testing. There's no doubt that AC testing and go, no go testing uh, is the way to go. Now, a lot of people don't wanna lug around a 100 pound high pot or a 200 pound high pot. So they've gone to small lightweight DC test equipment. And most of the manufacturers of test equipment have developed DC technology to go and test vacuum interrupters with. We have a vacuum integrity test set that we sell that's a go, no go test. The go, no go test is a very good test. It's a legitimate test to give you the condition of the interrupter today. It's the standard, no doubt about it. Our technology is to trend the interrupter and tell you when it's going to get to the point that it's going to fail. Now, our max set actually does a DC go, no go test as part of the procedure before it runs the MAC test. So you get that result. Doing DC testing with modern test sets that have modern rectifiers do not create the radiation that the older test sets did. So you don't have as much of the radiation issue as you had early on. And a DC test set, if it gives you a failure and then you reverse polarity because you've got all these stalactites and stalagmites on the, on, the, uh, on the contacts that have to be considered, and it gives you a failure again, you can pretty much believe that you've got a failed interrupter. Now, if it was mine, I would go ahead and at that point, go rustle up an AC test and lug it out there and test it with AC. What you're gonna see with a DC set or an AC set, specifically a DC set is you're gonna see conditioning. What conditioning does, and I don't know who's ever seen this, I've seen it a bunch of times, but I'm kind of an old shit, is when you put a DC test set or when you use an AC test set and you test a vacuum interrupter and it's very close to failure, it will fail, it will fail, it will, and then all of a sudden it will pass. And you will begin to second guess yourself. You'll say, did I have this connected right? You'll test it again, it passes again. You'll disconnect everything, reset up again like a good technician could do. You'll sit down, you go to take a lunch break, you'll think about it before you go talk to your boss or the owner. You'll go back and test it one more time and it'll pass. And you'll say, I must have done something wrong the first time for it to fail. What you've encountered is an interrupter that was right on the edge of failure and your actual test has conditioned the interrupter and caused it to pass. And if, if I can be given a minute, I'll circle back to this and explain to you how it does it. Basically, you've excited the gas molecules inside the chamber. They were diffused throughout the chamber. Now what you've done is you've 
forced them to be stuck on the sides and hidden behind the shields. And now there are fewer gas molecules between the contacts and it's passing. In the next few days, those will all reaccommodate and it will fail again. So if you get a fail result the first time you test a vacuum interrupter, do not believe the next test if it passes. That is a failed interrupter or one so close to failure it needs to be replaced. So my answer to the question would be, if you have a DC test set and it, and it, and it passes, you've got a good interrupter. If it fails, you should question it. You should reverse polarity test it again. If it still fails, I would probably go get an AC test set and put on it before I tore the breaker down or declared the breaker not fit for service. Okay, okay. thank you, Finley. I've, I've got several questions coming in. We can table those until uh, you finish the presentation if you'd like, or I can continue on with a couple more. Uh, let's try to get through the material here because we're getting close to our hour. This okay. is the actual, this is actual vacuum interrupter uh, fa failure plot where you see the inner equipment was installed in the 70s and 80s. Uh, in the 90s, a lot of the gear was replaced with vacuum gear. And then you start to see failures in the 2000s. You can see where we're at today and you can see what's happening. The failure rate is strictly a bathtub curve, just like everything. You know, your flat screen TV, uh, your lawnmower, everything you buy has a, has a bathtub failure curve. The problem is we're trying to determine today with a vacuum interrupter really where this is. And this technology, this equipment is the only tool we have to determine that. So as this window begins to open and we see more and more failures, we're seeing about nine times the failures today we saw in 2000. And, and as this continues to accelerate, it's something that needs to be considered. And if you do a go, no go test, and then you wait five years to test the equipment again, it could have leaked the atmosphere in that five years and you will have been running your equipment uh, unprotected. That's what you have to be concerned with. This is a short video that shows the field coil being attached. Basically to run the test, you take this coil and you attach it and wrap it around the, the interrupter. We also have rigid coils built for specific applications like GE power back breaker, uh, VHKs, ADVACs that, that go on very quickly. But this particular flexible coil takes two or three minutes to install, five wraps around the coil, then attach to the test set. Overall, the MAC test will take about 20 minutes longer to do than your normal testing. Uh, probably 30 minutes on the first one, then about 20 minutes after that. If you're using a flexible coil, if you're using the rigid coil, it's only a few minutes. The rigid coil is very quick. The flexible coil is universal. It's what comes with the test set. That's basically attaching the coil to the test set uh, for the project. As you see right here, guys, this is the rigid coil that attacks the GE power back breaker. You see the handle on the top. You just physically take it off and douse it over the pole. One, two, three. It's very quick to do versus the flex coil. It also comes with this amplifier that creates more field. You have to about have to have an excess of 400 gauss of magnetic field at the center of the interrupter as the as the as the interrupter gets bigger and the loop gets bigger, you have to have more field. Anything over 400 gauss uh, saturates the field and you don't see any change in ion current. Anything under 400 gauss and you will get a false reading. Uh, these are the, the uh, coils we use in the lab for doing lab testing where we can take the interrupter out of the breaker and test them in the lab. We do a lot of testing for uh, vacuum interrupter manufacturers. We do a lot of forensics testing. This is typically our interpreting test results. Basically, the, what we recommend is if your pressure is, is, is low in the minus four range and you have less than 300, 3,000 operations and greater than 50% wear, uh, we recommend uh, you look at the breaker every 10 years. If you have less than 50% wear, we recommend you look at it every five years. If it's in the minus three to minus four PA range, and it has less than 3,000 operations every five years. If it has greater than 50% wear, we say you should look at it every three to five years. If it's in the minus two to minus three PA, there again, if it has greater than 50% wear, we recommend you replace it. If it has less than 3,000 operations and greater than 50% wear, we recommend you look at it every three to five years. You have to understand, uh, and if you have a greater pressure than uh, minus two, we recommend you replace the interrupter. And that can actually be uh, done based on condition. If it's in a non-critical application, 
um, and you can get to it every year, there are people like Con Ed that try to run them to the bitter edge. And there are people uh, that replace them very, that, uh, replace them at minus two. What this gives you the capacity to do is go out and train your entire fleet of interrupters. You'll find that 90% of them are in the middle somewhere and you have many years to where you're gonna have to replace them but you'll find some that had high leak rates that were manufactured improperly or have been mistreated electrically or thermally and need to be considered or replaced. This gives you the technology to trend and look for that failure that you don't have now. Uh, this is the flyer on the set, on the tech. Uh, we have about 600 of these in service in the United States. Like I said, uh, Chevron, Encore, Potomac, Shermco. A lot of the people on this call have these sets. Uh, they are available for rental and, uh, most of the NETA companies either have them or have access to them. Shermco's got five of them, for instance, spread out throughout their testing company. Uh, here's the specifications, the operating conditions. Uh, the, treat this just like a high pot. You get close to 80% humidity, don't try to use this test, just like a high pot. Needs to be in an environment that's not really humid or you're going to get the same kind of false results that you get with a high pot. This is like the last piece of the puzzle. You know, it says here, you know, we had the high potential test for insulation. We knew about the number of operations and the age of the breaker. We could measure the contact resistance. Now we can actually add the condition of the VI and trend the VI to failure. That gives us the ability to look into the future and to be able to determine if this equipment needs maintenance, need repair. You've got hundreds of interrupters in your plant. If you go out and you trend them, maybe every year you need to replace one or two. You don't need to replace them all. You don't need to go out and replace a lot of them. It's very easy actually to move poles around on a breaker and create good breakers if you know which pole, which interrupter is the high pressure interrupter and which one's the offender. Uh, these are some of our products. Obviously, we have uh, ArcSafe safety products. We have a field service company. We have breaker repair shops. But basically our interrupter division and our repair lab. We have a complete high voltage, high power test facility in Dallas that I work at, and we're able to do a high voltage, high, high, high current testing for you if, if needed, uh, certification type work. When we have uh, thermal chambers where we can do advanced aging of lubricants and mechanism parts, we do all kinds of lab work there. These are where our breaker service shops and service companies are located across the group. Uh, pretty much gives you uh, Colorado, pretty much handles uh, the Dakotas, and, and then we've got them situated throughout the U.S. That's where our service centers are. Justin can help you with that. Uh, uh, this is the phone number and my email address. If you're interested in, in more technical information, some papers that support some of the things I've said today, or you have more questions, uh, feel free to email me. We were set up for an hour. Uh, uh, we have about eight more minutes. Justin, you got some questions? I do indeed. Um, so first off, does uh, VLF testing or very low frequency testing have any use in testing vacuum interrupters? No, we've tried uh, everything you can imagine. Pull forces, high pot testing, uh, current draws, all sorts of things to trend uh, related to pressure. You really have to get the ion current you have so much skin effect, okay? So the skin effect has nothing to do with the number of, uh, of air molecules, uh, gas molecules inside the center. So you have to take the skin effect, hold that on a null set. Then you have to do another test and, and subtract one from the other to get the actual ion current going through the interrupter. We do that with the max set because we don't have a magnetic field applied to the first test. And then we apply the magnetic field get the total ions, and then we subtract the skin effect to get the resultant. You can't do that with a high pot. So you have to have the DC field to have a varying ion flow to be able to get an accurate amount of current that's passing through the interrupter that's related to the number of gas molecules. Hey, this is going to be a four-hour topic at NIDA. I'm going to do this in four hours at NIDA. We're doing it in 55 minutes here. So <laughs> We're moving pretty fast. What's the next question, Justin? Sure. Um, so to be proactive, is it your recommendation to start changing out vacuum bottles at the 20 to 25 year mark uh, for all vacuum contactors and uh, medium voltage breakers? Vacuum contactors, yes. Vacuum breakers, no. 
No, I, I would not unilaterally start changing out vacuum interrupters at 20 or 25 years. There are some manufacturers and some types that I would. I don't feel comfortable talking about them online here, but uh, I'd be glad to talk to you about it offline. There are problematic interrupters, there are problematic breakers, and there are some that perform very well when they're 25 years old. So no, I would take and I would bring in someone and I would add to your normal maintenance testing, a MAC test, get a baseline test, and at the next maintenance cycle, get another test, chart a trend line and see which ones have steep trend lines to failure and which ones don't. I think if you replaced all the interrupters you have that are 20, 25 years old, probably 80% of them would still have an excess of 10 years of service life left. So I would not recommend that. It'd be very expensive uh, unless criticality is just so important to you. We have some applications like in submerged dark furnaces where they have to replace them very often. We have some uh, government installations in places that replace things very often, but general industrial and utility applications it's going to be in excess of 20 or 25 years before you're going to need to replace the interrupter. And you're going to find some in your system that are still in mid-range condition uh, 25 years in. You're going to find some that are failed, and you're going to find some that are near failure. And those are the ones you need to find, and that's what this technology is for. Thank you, Finley. Um, just a reminder that this is being recorded, and we will have this available um, likely early next week. We'll do some edits to it and have it out to the registration list. A couple more questions here. Finley, looks like we have at least four more minutes. Um, what happens when you get SF6 gas leaking into the vacuum interrupter? Um, there are designs in the UK where 11 kV or 33 kV interrupters is sited inside a SF6 gas-filled chamber. Okay, SF6 very heavy. Okay, SF6 is very heavy. So typically you don't get much SF6 inside the vacuum interrupter tip. And if you did, it would be a good thing, not a bad thing because it is a, it's a very good insulating gas. If you could fill your gas, your interrupter with SF6 and keep it in there, uh, that would not be a bad thing. It's kind of like getting uh, Ascarol or PCBs in your mineral oil. That's not a bad thing until the environmental issue caused. So since SF6 is very heavy, if you do, it typically propagates toward the bottom. It tends to settle. And when you have a leak in an SF6 interrupter, typically it leaks to the ground, okay? Uh, if you had a leaking uh, vacuum interrupter inside an SF6 environment, which there are a lot of gas enclosed uh, vacuum breakers, uh, I think you would treat that just as if it was a normal, uh, vacuum problem. We, we do have special coils and we do all of the, the different uh, oil circuit or gas circuit reclosures. So we do have utilities that use our technology on bucket trucks and test all their ink reclosers. So we do see some of that. I think getting SF6 in your vacuum interrupter would be way better than letting moisture into your vacuum interrupter. So you know, obviously I haven't tested that. So, you know, just from, from, from a pure, looking at it from the pure science side, I wouldn't be afraid to get SF6 in my interrupter. I don't know how that would happen or when it would happen, but if it did happen, it wouldn't bother me. All right, the next question I have is this reader has, uh, this listener has read in NIDA that performing an AC high pot test on vacuum bottles has a radioactive hazard. Can you please explain why and how serious is that? Yeah. There's really no radiation hazard with AC, it's with DC. If you have a halfway rectifier powering your DC high pot, then you can create some small level radiation. The smart thing to do if you have any concern is, is, is point the breaker toward the wall where the steel face plate, the blast plate on the front of the breaker is between you and the breaker, attach your high pot uh, back up 10 feet and don't worry about it. The radiation emissions are very small and you'll have to have an old Vaughn or an old uh, hypertronics test set with a half wave rectifier to get any substantial radiation output. Not really with AC. Any particular uh, thoughts on advantages of vacuum breakers installed in a gas insulated switch gear? If you can get the, if you could get the vacuum interrupter inside an SF6 uh, enclosure and fill it full of SF6, you would have uh, a very dry environment. You'd have a very safe environment. The problem is SF6 breakers leak, they leak. Their leak rate is 100X of the vacuum interrupter. 
a vacuum interrupter is a hundred times more reliable than an SF6 breaker from a leaking standpoint. We repair SF6 interrupters and keeping them from leaking, resealing them, pressure transmitters, uh, seals, uh, the mechanical seal where the operator goes through the gas uh, chamber. SF6 breakers are problematic. Uh, at low and medium voltage breakers, you need to get rid of them and go strictly to vacuum breakers. There's no doubt about it. Plus, uh, there's legislation and changes in OSHA coming that are going to require you to replace these gas breakers. Even more problems keeping up and registering the gas in the future. Uh, but if you know SF6, is, you know, from an engineering standpoint, uh, if we were in a suit and the whole world was filled with SF6, we would not have many electrical fires. Pretty All right, Finley. Well, we are right at the uh, hour. Um, we can. What we'll do is we'll take these additional questions. I'll forward them to Finley. We have email addresses for everyone that's registered, so we'll get right back to you on those uh, as we can. Uh, everyone, thank you. We're excited that you joined us. There was a lot of enthusiasm for today's call. Finley, thank you for a great presentation today, sir. Our next, uh, our next one will be in about a month and uh, three or four weeks. We're going to do. Uh, maintenance topics related to low and medium voltage breaker maintenance and industry topics, modern industry, modern industry topics. So look for that to come out. Look forward to talking to you then uh, over and out from uh, downtown Mineral Wells, Texas. Thank you very much.